Divinity and Margaret E. Fleck, uh, Chair in Anglican Studies. The Reverend Dr. Chris Britton will moderate the questions. Thank you, uh, Chris. And for the participants, you will see at the bottom of your screen a question and answer option. And so please use that in order to type in your question and we will absolutely do our best to ensure that as many questions as possible are answered. And now it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Father Nathan Humphrey, who is the Rector Designate of St. Thomas. He's cur currently serving at St. John's Church in Newport, Rhode Island and joining us from there. Uh, welcome. And uh, he will be coming to St. Thomas in July, I hear on Canada Day, very appropriately. Uh, we're very grateful to have him with us here this evening to represent St. Thomas's, along with Father Chris D'Angelo and Father David Brinton. So welcome, Father Humphrey, and I'll hand it over to you now to do the opening prayer and make a few remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Mora. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this evening, to be encouraged and enlightened through your servant, Michael. Through his words, give unto us an increase in faith, hope, and love, that fortified by these virtues, you would use our minds, our imaginations, and our wills to embrace the faith once delivered to the saints so that we may impart to a world weighed down by anxiety and fear, hope in the future you have promised to us in the gift of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. With you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, world without end, amen. Thank you again. Due in part to the pandemic, I haven't even arrived in Canada to take up my post, so I want to thank Canon Brinton, currently interim priest of St. Thomas's, for graciously suggesting I take this opportunity, not only to say a few words about the history of the Larkin Stewart lectures, but to introduce myself. Like this evening's speaker, I'm a cleric in the Episcopal Church. And in fact, before Michael Curry was elected to the Episcopate, we both served in the Diocese of Maryland, though he was then a Cardinal Rector of an historic parish in Baltimore, and I was merely a candidate for holy orders. General Convention was to be held in Baltimore this coming summer, and as a member of the deputation from the Diocese of Rhode Island, I was looking forward to returning to the city where my ordained life in the Episcopal Church began. And I'm sure Bishop Curry was looking forward to seeing old friends as well. Maryland isn't the only thing we have in common, however. Bishop Curry and I are both graduates of Yale Divinity School. And here's another, though you may think it a bit of a stretch, I am a native Southern Californian who is moving to Toronto. Bishop Curry preached at the wedding of a native Californian who lived in Toronto before marrying her English husband. Coincidence? You be the judge. On Tuesday, Bishop Peter Eaton of Miami, Florida called to congratulate me on my appointment to St. Thomas's, but wondered whether I'd been a bit precipitous in planning a move to Canada before anyone even knew the results of the presidential election. But my call to St. Thomas's hasn't been motivated by political considerations, but by the Anglo-Catholic heritage of this parish. And among St. Thomas's goodly heritage is the Larkin Stewart Lectures. The aim of the Larkin Stewart Lectures is to invite speakers who will attract a broad audience and address theology in the broadest sense of the word. I would think this applies particularly well to the primate of my current province. Remember that wedding I mentioned? A reported 1.9 billion people worldwide watched it live. Presiding Bishop Curry is thus believed to have preached to the largest congregation ever. Nearly 2 billion people heard him testify to the redemptive power of Jesus' love that day. According to one report, Social media interest in the event peaked during the passionate sermon, at which point people following the ceremony sent 40,000 tweets a minute. Imagine that. So the lecture committee is to be commended for bringing to us a man whose experience in addressing a broad audience on theology in the broadest sense of the word is unquestioned. But what gave rise to these lectures in the first place? 
In 1904, a 17-year-old boy named Cecil Stewart began serving as an acolyte at St. Thomas's alongside a 19-year-old young man named Gerald Larkin. Thus began a lifelong friendship that was to have a profound impact on both of them and on St. Thomas's and nearby Trinity College. Gerald was destined to take over his father's business as the president of the Salada Tea Company, and probably for that reason never pursued higher education. He appears to have lived somewhat vicariously through his friend Cecil, who entered Trinity in 1907 intending to become a priest. It is due to this eventual vicar and then rector of St. Thomas's that Gerald Larkin first took an interest in Trinity. Trinity's magnificent chapel and the building named after him on campus attest to Gerald Larkin's philanthropy. And the Larkin Stewart lectures established in honor of these two remarkable men is a testimony to the conscience of how much both Trinity and St. Thomas's owe them. It is not too much of a stretch to say that if those two teenagers had not served together as acolytes, neither St. Thomas's nor Trinity College would be what they are today. On that note, it is my pleasure to yield the floor to the Most Reverend Colin Johnson to introduce formally this evening's Larkin Stewart Lecturer. Thank you, Father Humphrey, for such a wonderful tribute to the long-standing partnership between Trinity and St. Thomas's uh, in these lectures. I would also like to thank all of the members of the Larkin Stewart Committee as they prepared for the, this organization tonight. It was General Synod in 2016. It was right after lunch. I was sitting with a longtime member of General Synod from Montreal. The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry, was about to speak. The woman next to me said, the orders of the day say he's only bringing greetings. I have been looking forward to hearing him preach. Don't worry, I said, he will. But the agenda only gives him 10 minutes. Oh, for Bishop Michael, I replied, that's merely a suggestion. And we did hear him preach. He spoke of the dignity of the children of God, each bearing the image of God. And what made it so powerful was that the context in which it was said. He had within that hour sent a video message to the people of the United States where the previous night there were a series of killings of young black men by police officers in different parts of the states. And then the killing of police officers in retaliation perhaps in other parts of the states in this horrific cycle of violence. He was trying to make sense of that. It was a simple but stunning talk and the conference room erupted in rapturous applause. We had all been blessed as we pondered our Christian faith. Unfortunately, I was the next speaker presenting the previous three years of the draft audited financial statements of General Synod. There were no rapturous applause. So tonight, at least I get a chance to speak before him. Bishop Michael Curry is no stranger to Canada or Toronto. He spent his childhood in Buffalo where his father was a priest, ordained deacon and priest in 1978. He has served in North Carolina, Ohio, and Maryland. He was consecrated Bishop of North Carolina in 2000, the first black diocesan Bishop in the South, where he served until he was elected as presiding Bishop of the Episcopal Church at the General Convention in 2015 on the first ballot. Remember that the Episcopal Church is an international church that spans not only the USA, but is present in 15 different countries. As Father Humphreys said, many people uh, worldwide know him for his homily at the royal wedding. But he has a passion for stewardship, evangelism, and discipleship. But perhaps he is most noted for the powerful leadership he provides in the renewal of the church with his invitation for us to join the Jesus movement. I have witnessed and admired his gracious presence under pressure his jubilant proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his forth, forceful advocacy for the full inclusion of all God's children. It's my great privilege tonight 
to introduce the most reverend Michael Curry and invite him to speak to us this evening. My brother Colin, thank you. It, it's always a joy to be with you and with all of my sisters, brothers, and siblings. And always a privilege to be with you whenever you give a report on the annual audit. It was a thrilling moment for all of us. <laughs> we served together um, on the College for Bishops and, and uh, Colin is just, um, has been a remarkable teacher for those who um, are growing into Episcopal ministry. Um, you are a brother of wisdom and I account our friendship a real blessing. It's, it's wonderful to be with you and and I hope I want to just do a sound check. Everything's okay. You're hearing me. The provost gives you thumbs up. Okay, we're in, we're in good shape. Okay. Um, again, thank you for this. I really do wish that I could actually be with you um, in a more incarnate, embodied way. But but thank God for the technology that at least makes makes it possible for us to be together in this way. But I look forward to a time to be able to be in Toronto always love coming to Toronto. I told uh, some of the folk before when, when I grew up in Buffalo, when we wanted to go to the big city, we didn't go to New York, we went to Toronto. And so I look forward to being there again with you, probably not during the winter, but uh, look forward to being with you. Um, holding on to hope in troubling times, I must tell you, when I wrote the book, Love is the Way, colon, holding on to hope in troubling times, that was long before I had ever heard of uh, COVID-19 um, or even thought about a, pand a pandemic, um, long before um, I expected the depth of division in the United States to be as profoundly manifest as it has been during the recent elections. Um, although I knew the divisions were there, that was no surprise. Um, and, and long before I expected there to be a profound racial reckoning um, in the United States, um, which had been a long time coming, but I didn't expect it to erupt um, as it did in, when George Floyd was murdered, Breonna Taylor, um, and so many, so many others. Long before all of that, I wrote the book or started writing the book and it had its title, but I have a feeling that I had nothing to do with that subtitle, holding on to hope in troubling times, because that's what we've got to do. And maybe that's what we have to do in the best of times and the worst of times, which I suspect are these times too. But the truth is we got to figure out how to hold on to hope. I think it was Dante over the gates of hell, abandon all hope ye who enter here. Without hope, we cease, we cease to be. And with hope, just a little bit, you can make it. So let me back into that by, by talking a little bit about, well, actually reflecting on the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in, uttered in the last year of his life over and over again, when he was frustrated um, and was not seeing uh, the hope for success of not only the movement for civil and human rights, but the movement to eradicate poverty, global poverty, and to bring an end to war. He took seriously the words of John Kennedy, mankind will either bring an end to war or war, war will bring an end to mankind. And he didn't see much hope of that happening. And these are the words he said over and over again. We will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. 
we will either learn to live together as brothers, sisters, siblings, or we will perish together as fools. The choice, the choice is ours. Chaos or community. When Dr. King said that, there was a, a note of despair, to be very honest. He was brooding a lot in his last days. The Vietnam War did not look like it would end soon and young men were being brought back in body bags, many of them disproportionately from minority groups and the poor. But no matter their race, no matter their socioeconomic background, they were children of God and they were being brought home in body bags. The country was profoundly divided. It was divided along socioeconomic lines and along political lines. There are some similarities between 1968 and the year in which we find ourselves. He was deeply frustrated. He was actually depressed. His staff members were concerned about him and consulted a psychologist. But he finally, when confronted by one of the members of the staff said, no, these sound like words of despair, but they are the words of prophetic despair. And prophetic despair is not the absence of hope. It's frustration with the way things are, but holding out a shred of hope that things can become what they are meant to be. We will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. We are not slaves to fate. The choice is ours. Can we learn to live together? Can we live, learn to live together as more than individualized collections of self-interest? And can we, as a human race, learn how to become more, let me be honest, more than simply the human race? That is not good enough. It's a point, it's a point of departure, but that's all it is. I mean, the truth is, um, you know, being a member of the human race, I mean, to be very honest, um, I mean, you don't get honorary degrees for being a member of the human race. I mean, it's not, it's not something that um, people congratulate you. Oh, well, congratulations, you're a member of the human race. I mean, you know what I mean? It's not, it's really not, don't misunderstand me. It's not that much of an accomplishment. I mean, the truth is you didn't have anything to do with it. Y your parents had something to do with it. And, and even they only had a small role to do. Being a member of the human race is, it's, it's really, that's basically a biological category. And, and biologically, if I remember correctly, now I, I've been out of school a long time, but I remember even eighth grade biology, um, um, that basically members of the human race um, are part of the animal world. Um, and we're part of the animal world. And there are seven, several salient characteristics of members of the animal creation or the animal world. Um, but among these are three in particular, um, respiration, consumption, and reproduction. Uh, we breathe, we eat, and we make more of our own kind. Well, my wife has two cats who are capable of doing that. Well, actually they can do two out of the three. They've been to the vet. They can only do two out of the three. But it's not much of an accomplishment to be a biological, and that, that's a matter of, of inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide, which has an important biological and ecological function. I mean, it makes it possible for the plant world. We give them what they need, and they release carbon dioxide uh, and give us what we need. So there is a symbiotic thing going on. God, um, that's not an accident. God knew what God was doing. Um, that's true. But, but, but didn't Jesus say something like, is not life more than food? 
Is not the body more than clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. Are you not of more value than even those priceless creatures of God? No, no, no. Life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. Of course you need food. Of course you need clothing. Of course we do. But being a human being is more than just consumption. It is more than participating in photosynthesis. It is more than just merely existing. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom, its righteousness and all these things, they'll be yours as well. I want to suggest, if we look carefully at Jesus of Nazareth, we will see consistently in his teachings and in the manner of his life, the working out and the unfolding of a way of love that has its source in the God who my Bible says is love. I believe I'm right. First John chapter four, beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. And those who love are born of God and know God. And those who do not love do not know God. Why? Because God is love. I didn't say love is God. God is love. God is the source of love. God is the source of the love that is the source of life. God is the source of the love that is the very energy of, of, of existence. God is the source of love that makes us more than merely the human race, that, that gives us the potential to become the human family of God. And in that, my brothers and sisters, in that is our hope and salvation. I could be wrong, but, but I'm telling you, I, I am convinced that, you know, when you look at John 19, the passion in John's gospel, when Jesus is on the cross um, and he's in sort of the last moments and um, I mean, he's dying there and, and kind of remember, he, he kind of, it's like he looks down somehow be, beyond the sweat and the blood and the stench and the horror of it, all, but he can see his mama. And he, and he sees the beloved disciple and he, and he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. He says to the disciple, behold your mother. And the gospel writer John says, and from that moment, the beloved disciple took Mary into his home as his mother, as his own mother. And in that, at that point, John says, Jesus said, I thirst. And soon after that, he says, it is finished. It is accomplished. The reason I have come has begun. He took that woman into his own home as his own mother. And that way of love created beloved community there on the cross. My brothers, my sisters, my siblings, this way of love that, that saturates the passion in, in John's gospel, that, that saturates by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. That's at the Last Supper. That's just hours before this. Um, uh, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. That's at the Last Supper in John's gospel, before, just before this cruci crucifixion, a new commandment, not a new option, not a new suggestion, not a new possibility, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples not how doctrinally accurate you are, not how right you are, not how even righteous you look like you are. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Now, 
it is finished. It is accomplished. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself, said God. I am convinced if God came among us in the person of Jesus to show us the way to be in a right relationship and reconciled with the God who is the creator of us all and the way to a right relationship and reconciled relationship with each other as children of that one God and creator and therefore as brothers, as sisters, as siblings, as the children of God. That's why Jesus came. He came to show us the way to be reunited with our God and to be reunited with each other. In so doing, he came to show us the way to become more than individual collections of self-interest. He came to show us the way to become not just the human race, but how to become the human family of God, how to live beyond the chaos and to find the way into community, the beloved community, as Dr. King called it. Um, um, the kingdom of God, as Jesus in the New Testament calls it, the, that new heaven and that new earth. Um, he came to show us the way to become the new creation. Even now, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done now on earth just as it is in heaven. And he showed us that the way to that beloved community is the way of an unselfish, sacrificial love that actually seeks the good the welfare and the well-being of others as well as the self. I was um, like, like many of the clergy who are here um, over the years, I've done a lot of weddings and, um, and I would dare say when I've been working with the couple who are getting married um, and offering them the scriptural options for readings um, for the wedding, Nine times out of 10, I would say nine times out of 10, no matter how many times I suggest, oh, there's a wonderful passage in Ephesians, oh, there's something wonderful in Colossians, and there are all these other possibilities, Song of Solomon and all this. Nine times out of 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, okay, and that's fine, and, and it's true. And I remember when I was in high school and we had the little collections of poetry, and you had sort of Shakespearean sonnets and, and 1 Corinthians 13 and, you know, other, other poetry. And it is, it's one, it's just exquisite poetry. But in all honesty, Paul didn't write it thinking about my ninth grade English class. Actually, Paul didn't write it thinking about, I mean, a wedding, though it applies to a marriage, applies to any relationship. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, you remember? Go back to seminary, go back to New Testament. Paul wrote um, 1 Corinthians 13 to help a dysfunctional church that was tearing itself apart by unbridled self-interest and selfishness um, unenlightened self-interest, as John Stuart Mill would say. It was tearing itself apart and literally destroying itself. Remember how he begins in, in chapter one? I love the beginning. He says, he's writing a letter to them, so he's writing from afar. He says, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people um, that there are factions and divisions among you. Now, what I love about that is that is so church. I, I, don't, I don't know about the churches in Canada, but every church that I've been a pastor of, there have been, there's always been a Chloe. Chloe is that somebody who knows everybody's business in the congregation. And Chloe knows all the dirt on everybody and all the news, good, bad, and otherwise. And, and Paul begins this marvelous epistle. Um, it has been reported to me by Chloe's people. It's not just Chloe, but she's got a little army under her that's reporting to Paul. And, and, he's, and he says, it's been reported, you have divided yourselves into factions. Um, some say I've been baptized by Apollos. Some I've been baptized by so-and-so and so-and-so -and, -so, um, and on and on. And he, and he almost tears his hair out and says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. And then if you read 1 Corinthians, you can see this bitter destruction 
of self-centeredness the hubris, that prideful self-will that makes me the center of the universe and you and everybody else, including God, the periphery. And when that happens, when it all, it's all about me, when I'm the center of the universe, it's what Dr. King called the reverse Copernican revolution. Um, instead of the sun being the center, it, we are the center. Instead of God at the center, we're at the center. And that is a formula for human self-destruction. It does not work. It has not worked. It never will work. And in the church and current, they were suing each other. They were tearing each other apart. Rich folk got their communion before poor folk. Some folks said, I speak in tongues and you don't. That means I got the Holy Spirit and you don't have it. I'm going to heaven and you're not. Tearing each other apart, bitterly tearing each other apart. And Paul says at the end of chapter 12, let me show you a still more excellent way, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. Love, love is not jealous. Love is not rude. Love is not boastful. Love does not insist on its own way. Love rejoices in the right, rejoices in the good. In other words, love seeks the good, the welfare, and the well-being of, of others, as well as the self. Love is not just about me. Love is about we, and we includes me, but just me may not include you. Now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul heard what Jesus lived. God so loved the world. And he gave his only son. He didn't take. God gave. That way of love is the cure for self-centeredness. That attitude and way of love as a way of life is the way of life for us all. A few years ago, in, actually it was in 2016, during our last presidential campaign when Donald Trump was running against Hillary Clinton, it became a contentious campaign um, as it did recently. And in the campaign, in that campaign, there were always protesters at the rallies of the different um, candidates. If it was a Clinton rally, there were Trump protesters protesting there. It was a Trump rally. There were Clinton protesters. And one rally happened not far from where I live now in Raleigh in North Carolina. It happened in Fayetteville. The rally was uh, a Trump rally. And people were wearing that, the MAGA hats, you know, the red hats, make America great uh, again. Um, and uh, there were protesters there who were probably Clinton supporters, but protesting. And things got a little bit out of hand, nothing serious, but enough that the sheriffs came in and removed the protesters. As they were leave, leading the protesters out, um, one of the Trump supporters, a guy named John, um, John McGraw, who was 79 years old, 79 year old white guy, John McGraw jumped or leapt over the sheriffs as they were escorting the protesters out and he punched one of the protesters in the face. Sheriffs immediately arrested him and they took him and um, as I said, arrested him. And at that moment, he was heard to say, and a, a reporter with the Raleigh News and the Observer heard it. He said, and I quote, he deserved it. The next time we see him, we might have to kill him because we don't know who he is. He might be a member of a terrorist organization. As I said, McGraw was arrested for that. And he was charged with assault. He eventually pled guilty. He was um, sentenced to probation, community service, and that kind of thing. And at the sentencing hearing, the man he had punched, who was named Raheem Jones, who was a young Black man, was sitting there in the courtroom. McGraw apologized to the court and turned and apologized 
to Raheem Jones. After the proceedings had concluded, the two men faced each other. And McGraw, who had punched Jones, said this. If I met you in the street, the same thing would have occurred. I would have said, go home. One of us is gonna get hurt. That's what I would have said. But we are caught up in a political mess today. We are caught up in a political mess today. And we gotta heal our country. And it didn't end there because Jones, who had been punched, said to McGraw, who had punched him and who had apologized, let's go out to lunch. And they did. There's an old spiritual of sung, created by antebellum slaves, folk who had lost all hope of freedom. Folk who lived without worldly hope, which is why one of their spirituals says, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. For there was no hope to be had from this world. And they heard the story of Jeremiah. They heard Jeremiah's cry and identified with him in the preaching that they heard. Passages like this, my joy is gone, grief is upon me. My heart is sick. Hark the cry of my poor people far and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is, is there her king not in her? The harvest is past. The summer is ended. We are not saved. For the hurt of my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn and, and am dismayed. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Those slaves who, who lived, as, as James Weldon Johnson in his hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, says, who lived in days when hope unborn had died. They listened to Jeremiah's cry. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no position there? Is there any hope in the midst of this nightmare? And Howard Thurman, in an analysis of this, the spiritual that emerged from this passage, says the slave did an incredible thing in a flight of spiritual genius, clearly inspired by nothing but the Holy Spirit of the living God. They sang back, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, there is a bomb in Gilead. They said, sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life's in vain, but but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. And then they said, so if you cannot preach like Peter and you cannot pray like Paul, you just tell the love of Jesus, how he died to save us all. He didn't die for what he could get out of it. He didn't give himself for earning money or earning fame. He gave his life for the good of others, for the well-being of others. That's what love looks like. And they said, that is the bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. As long as there is God, as long as there is the God who is love, there is hope. There is a bomb in Gilead. Unless you think, well, somebody could be thinking, well, preacher, that sounds good. But will it work in the real world? I'm glad you asked that question. On the great seal of the United States, I don't know if you've ever seen, we all had to learn about it in the fifth grade and color it in. Um, on the great seal, there's the bald eagle 
And um, and the eagle has in its talons on one, um, it has a, a, a clump of arrows. And, and on the other, it has olive branches. And above the eagle, you see the words, which actually are the motto of the United States, e pluribus unum, from the Latin, from many, one from many diverse peoples, one people, one nation, e pluribus unum. Well, I learned about that in grade school. We all learned about it. And every once in a while, you hear a politician say something about it. But it never occurred to me until this past September, given um, our perplexities, to look up the origin of that Latin, those Latin words, e pluribus unum. And I did some digging and I've since verified that it, this is accurate. And I discovered that the use of the phrase probably came from the writings of Cicero of the Roman Republic. The founding fathers were enamored of the Roman Republic. And Cicero wrote, and this is where it is thought the phrase e pluribus unum comes from. Cicero wrote, when each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, it makes one out of many possible. When each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, it makes one out of many possible. I think I heard somebody else say something close to that. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think Jesus said that and Rabbi Hillel said the same thing. I, I think I heard Jesus of Nazareth say over and over again, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I could be wrong. I think I remember Jesus telling a parable of a good Samaritan about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And I think Jesus got that from Moses, who in Leviticus said, you shall love your neighbor. I think it's Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I want to suggest, I've been saying this to Americans, but I want to say this to a global community now. I want to suggest that when Cicero, Jesus, and Moses are all telling you to love your neighbor as yourself, you might want to listen. <laughs> I want to suggest that this is not just religious talk. This is the key to finding the hope for humanity, to love the other as much as I love myself. Oh, if you cannot preach like Peter, you cannot pray like Paul. Just tell the love of Jesus, how he died to save us all. There is the bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is the bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. And there, from the lips of slaves, is hope in troubled times. Amen. Bishop Curry, thank you. I thought I'd just let that sink in for a minute. Let us absorb some of that. Uh, you took us on quite a journey. <laughs> and uh, we give you well a lot of thanks for that. Um, we're going to turn to some questions in a moment. And just to remind uh, mind our, our, our attendees, the way to register your question, please, in the first instance, would be to look, look at the bottom of your screen to a Q&A a button and if you press that you can type in your questions 
Um, we have a couple already, and I think I'll just dive right into them. Um, but I'll warn Bishop Curry before I do, that one of the things I love about this community and, and our constituency is they don't tend to throw curveballs. <laughs> they want to dig in, they want to push, and they want to press. And that's not untrue of other questions we've received already. And so uh, we're not going to warm you up. I think you warmed up. You warmed us up, and and our, we are responding. So <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Oh, well, thank you, sir. So, um, from one of our beloved alumna, very esteemed uh, Allison Barnett Cowan, I, I don't think I'll call out everyone, but uh, 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 I hope Allison doesn't mind. Um, first, thank you for your courage and faithfulness. Oh, thank you. It's kind. Thank you. But then she wants to dig in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Donald Trump has chosen to attend Episcopal services at Christmas and other times. Mm. How do you cope with being, in a sense, his chief pastor? And did you have any access to him? So, um, the, the, the honest answer, it, well, the honest answer to the letter is easy, no. Um, the, the last time I was at the White House was um, the, last, the closing days of, of President Obama in 2015 or whenever that was. Um, and uh, most of the Office of Faith Based um, work in the White House caters to the religious right. And so the mainstream, we don't, we're not, um, we're, we're not uh, counted. Um, ours is the counter narrative. Um, yes, he, there is a church in Florida near Mar Lago um, um, where, where he has attended on Christmas Eve. Um, I, I, I don't know what they'll do this Christmas. I have no idea. His, his wife is, a, is more devout. Um, um, she grew up Orthodox and attends Episcopal churches um, when they're the nearest one nearby. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd be surprised um, if he'll be at... I, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't really know. I don't know where he'll go to church on, on Christmas. But the deeper question is, um, while I don't have a direct pastoral relationship, um, if I was asked to come to speak to him, I would. And part of the pastoral relationship is to speak the truth as I understand it in love. Um, one of the things I wrote about in the book was, was the difficult struggle of learning how to stand and kneel at the same time. Um, um, and especially I learned, I mean, I learned that in nonviolent training that I took years ago, they didn't call it that, that's my calling to stand and kneel at the same time, but how to be present with somebody who profoundly disagrees with you and is angry and may even be violent and not to reciprocate in kind in an effective way, but to genuinely not to reciprocate in kind and to try as best you can to see them as a fellow child of God, just like you, made in the image of God, just like you. I call that kneeling before the image of God that is in the other. And, and I gotta do that, even when it's hard. And yet, you must stand at the same time to stand with your integrity for whatever it is you believe and hold to be true. You have to honor the other and kneel and yet honor your integrity and convictions and stand at the same time. I, I found that to be true when I was Bishop of North Carolina um, and, and we were working to be a truly to be what I used to call, a, well, Jesus said it, and the prophet said it, a house of prayer for all people for real, where all are equal and all are received and all are welcomed. Um, and, and that was, there was struggle. And I realized that I had to be the pastor of the diocesan flock. I had to kneel before them because I'm not God. 
And the nice thing is, neither are they. I used to remind them of that. <laughs> neither are they. None of us are. And so I kneel before them as children of God, just like me. And yet, I had to stand for convictions that I believed to be right and true. And in the long run, I think it's born fruit. Now, whether that would be true with President Trump or not, I have no idea. But the principle of kneeling and standing at the same time um, is one that I try to live by. If you just kneel and submit, that's not, uh-uh, uh-uh. If you just stand and be righteous, uh-uh, that's not either. I think the prophet Micah said, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God, to kneel and stand at the same time. And I would do the same if I was invited to the White House, whether it's Donald Trump in there or Joseph Biden. I hope and pray I would do the same thing. Hope that answered. That was a good question. I, yeah. <laughs> No, thank thank you very much. Uh, always a always a, a challenge when in a polemical situation to to be seen associating with with someone who symbolizes uh, one side of that polarity. But I guess that's the challenge of, of of leadership and Christian witness is to is to not allow that the the polarization to define you and and uh, in in that situation. So well, thank you. S Canon Stephen Fields has a question for you. Oh, Stephen. <laughs> what would you tell George Floyd's mother about Mary who witnessed the lynching of her son, Jesus? Are there any lessons to be learned? Mm -hmm. Any source of comfort? I I've not met George Floyd's mother, but I've been with Trayvon Martin's mother several times. Trayvon was the one who was killed, young boy, um, who was killed in Florida. That was near the beginning of what became Black Lives Matter and um, the national kind of awakening. Uh, I started with Michael Brown, um, Eric Garner in New York, Michael Brown in Missouri, and Trayvon Martin. He was the one wearing the hoodie, and he was just walking down the street. I've been with his mother on, just on a number of occasions. And I, and I actually told, it's funny to ask this question. I actually told her once that the way she, the way she carries the pain by trying to end the scourge of violence that took her son's life so that no other mother would weep. I actually told her one time, you remind me of what Mary must have been like, the mother of Jesus that um, I mean, this woman has committed her life now uh, to trying to eradicate the scourge of gun violence, which is out of control in the United States. It really is. Um, and she continues, she won't quit. And, and you're not gonna defeat her. I've been with her. I'm telling you, you're not gonna defeat her. But that's part of grief's work. It's part of redemption. Um, it's part of not letting his sacrifice be in vain. And she, and she does it. Um, and I would dare say that that uh, George Floyd's mother or, or Breonna Taylor's mother, or um, they are Pieta. They, they are. And and you know what? They're gonna win. <laughs> They're gonna win because they won't quit. <laughs> And they're right. Thank you. See, no, not no, no softballs so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, okay, <laughs> okay. A few more uh, uh, asking you to 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 respond. You can see what's on our mind up here in Canada. Um, we we are we are your neighbors to the north, but our hearts are very much uh, li linked to to what, what we observe um, and more yeah. than observe. I mean, we're so intertwined really with friends we and really family. Are. We really are. <laughs> Richard Reeves uh, puts the question this way. 
the United States is arguably even more divided today than four years ago, economically, geographically, politically, culturally. Even churches are divided by politics. So we asked, what specific role can Christians play in healing these divides? Thank you. Yeah, I'll tell you what, what we're trying to do, and I'm trying to get going in our church um, even more. And I've been saying it more in the last two months, um, um, giving some practical suggestions um, that we have to intentionally seek out relationships with people who are different than we are. And sometimes that's ethnic or racial. Sometimes that's socioeconomic. Sometimes that's political, ideological. And, and we have to seek out and cultivate, not, not for the purpose of converting somebody to our view, but for the purpose of nurturing a genuine human relationship. Now, everybody's not gonna be open to that. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of that, very much aware of that. But, but the reality is, I think it is incumbent on us now um, as Christians, um, from whatever perspective we have. And as I say, to, I've said to the folk and I said, whoever you voted for, wherever you stand on the aisle, you follow Jesus. And if you follow Jesus, the way of justice and reconciliation is the way of love. And you must reach out, you must reach out for a relationship. And so um, we try to give people some tools and we're trying to develop some more tools for doing that. Um, there's a group called Braver Angels, um, which is a group of people, and this is a secular group, it's not a religious group, they have a religious component. But what they do is they bring together through civic groups, church groups, um, as well as individuals, people who are clearly red and people who are clearly blue, and to some extent, folk in, in between, <coughs> and bring them together for deeper engagement, conversation, not debate about issues, but to cultivate the kind of relationships that can enable people to engage difficult questions held together by the relationship. And they have designs for doing that. Um, one of their uh, uh, designs is called With Malice Toward None that come from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address um, near the end of the, the Civil War with malice toward none and charity toward all Let us bind up the nation's wounds. That's what, uh, to hear a president of the United States say that, that's what I will give to hear that. Um, and so they've got a curriculum designed around that. Um, we've encouraged um, a, a, a curricular design on civil discourse for churches to use, um, to, to bring together people across differences and to actually learn some skills in both conversation, but also the cultivation of relationships. Um, we've got a curriculum that's designed around race um, and racism um, and white supremacy um, that, that's called the sacred ground. Um, that's a, that's a, a full curriculum that brings together people across the racial divides um, to do the hard work of getting to be in relationship, learning each other's stories for real, learning our cultural story for real, um, and then figuring out, okay, uh, to repent means to acknowledge where we have gone wrong um, and then learn from it and then turn, turn in a new direction. And it, the curriculum is designed to help people walk through that process together. All of those are, those are just some of the resources I'm trying to put in people's hands um, now. And, but I think this is gonna be the hard work of years to come because the divisions, I mean, I'm not just talking about differences, we're talking about polarities and, and divisions that I think are potentially injurious to democracy if we don't work at healing them. There are members of Congress, we've been in conversation with them. Actually, the civil discourse curriculum that we did, we had two Episcopalians who are members of Congress and they, believe me, they are polar opposites, but they're Episcopalian, they're Christians. <laughs> they are Christians um, and they could come together and model. We're gonna try to expand that kind of thing. And I, I have hope that um, people don't wanna see a country tear itself apart. Nobody wins from that. <laughs> everybody loses. And I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm, I am bound and determined um, to do everything I can and everything I can help the Episcopal Church to do, to be an instrument, not only of justice, of course we must be in it, I know that, but justice is not enough. Love must guide justice 
as Dr. King said, the, the end or the goal is redemption. The end, the goal is reconciliation. The end or the goal is the creation of the beloved community. And that must be our goal. That is a reflection of the kingdom of God. And we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I'm determined, I'm, I'm, I'm bound and determined. I got, I forgot how many more years I got left on my term. I think it's five more years. And then when I'm not doing that, I'm going to keep on doing it. <laughs> and keep, as long as the Lord gives me breath. <laughs> Bishop, I can't tell you how pleased I, I am to know that you don't actually know how much longer your term is. That's a very, very promising sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm not counting down the days or anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a nice segue to our next, I, I think we got about three more questions if you can, I know we're asking a lot of you, but uh, um, the, the next, the next, I mean, the next one I think is a nice segue from what you just, just said, because, and the next two are, are, are from people who are really with you on love, but they want to explore a, uh, the issue of love from a slightly different angle. And so the first one's from uh, questions from uh, Dr. Jeff Knowers. He uh, remembers uh, an, uh, the American ethicist uh, Beverly Harrison, um, well, taught many years at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Mm -hmm. She wrote an article uh, entitled The Power of Anger in the Work of Love. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Dr. Nowers is wondering, do you see a role for anger in the vision of love you sketched for us? That's a, wow. That's one of those horrible questions. As a, yeah. You know, yeah. I... <laughs> there is and there isn't. I mean, there is in the sense that, you know, that passage, where is it? In, in one of the Thessalonian letters, do not let the sun set, be, be angry, but, but do not sin. Um, I think there's something about do not let the sun set on your anger or something like that. Th there's some wisdom in that. Anger has a role. Genuine anger that somebody's suffering either because of benign neglect or overt action. The anger that, that a human being, a child of God is suffering, that, that's right. I mean, that, that, can be, uh, that can be an inspiration or energizing up to a point. But that anger must be channeled it must be channeled from emotion into positive action that seeks change. If it is channeled solely as anger, that's why I say love must guide anger. If it is channeled only as anger, it can become destructive. Even the passion for justice, if it is just justice by itself, can degenerate into revenge. And if it degenerates into revenge, then that's all it is. I believe the uh, Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Um, that's not ours. It, it lead that to God. <laughs> that's not us. Um, and, I, and I don't think God is into the vengeance business, but I think he was saying, that's not you all. That's above your pay grade. You can't handle that. Um, and, and so there is a place for channeled anger at what to be angry about, but not anger that turns to animosity toward even the people who perpetuate what is evil. Because and, and this, is, this is tough, this is hard. This is where it does get hard. Because even those who perpetuate the evil are victims of it, they are. They're actually slaves to it themselves. And the point of the way of love is to set all the captives free, T to set us free from whatever the oppression or injustice or the wrong is, and to set those who perpetuate knowingly or unknowingly the wrong or the evil or the injustice, to set them free. That is the point. Um, I've known over the years in, in the, I mean, I, I've known um, friends who've been involved in the movement, especially civil rights and human rights whose anger turned inward. And anger turned inward is not helpful. It, it's not helpful. It eats, it, it, it eats, it, it, it's a cancer. <laughs> it will eat you alive. 
and anger directed, you see what I'm saying? Instead of channeled, becomes destructive potentially of the other. Um, I've been in a lot of, of late, been in a lot of conversations um, a, around can I love and be an advocate for justice and peace? And, and, and my answer is you can't not. You can't, afford, if you're going to advocate for peace, you got to be peaceful. <laughs> if you're going to advocate for a just society, you cannot perpetuate more injustice in order to get the just society. It doesn't work. There is no other way to the beloved community outside of the way of my loving the other as much as I love myself. There's no other way. And, and in, interesting you'd say, ask this, because Dr. King wrestled with this um, in Birmingham, 1963, when they were, which was a tough siege to end segregation. But um, in the part of the preparation for the nonviolent resistors, uh, Dr. King developed what they nicknamed his 10 commandments. Um, and they were stuff like, uh, remember that the goal of the nonviolent protester is not victory, but reconciliation. Um, re remember to walk and talk in the manner of love for God is love. And it went on, it was 10 uh, principles like that. But the first one, and here was, I think, the stroke of genius. The first principle, before you march, meditate on the life and teachings of Jesus. Let him be the guide. Let his grace fill you and guide you. The old spiritual says, guide my feet, Lord, while I run this race. That, that, that makes it possible for me to do, as the, our old prayer book used to say about baptism, that which by nature I could not do. But guide my feet, Lord, by your grace. Lead me by your spirit and help me to live love the same way you do. That's work to channel anger by love into constructive positive action. That is a righteous thing. Pausing just to let that sink in as a little bit too, uh, because you're really helping us wrestle with some of the, I guess, spiritual challenges of the work of love, and uh, and and not denying anger, but but uh, working with that anger in appropriate ways. Our, our next question is actually is also thinking about, I, I would say, the spiritual challenges of the the, the kind the work of love. Um, uh, Jackie Jagodo uh, asks this: uh, You preach about loving our neighbors. As ourselves. I wonder, might there be problems today among some of us of loving ourselves mm. in the first instance? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've, um, um, I've, I've started saying, and like I said, I've, some, the problem being an extrovert, you really are doing a lot of thinking out loud, uh, which can get, uh, trust me, as a bishop, I've learned that that can get you into trouble. Oh, I, was, I was just thinking, that wasn't a conclusion, I was just thinking. Um, but one of the things I started saying, and, and, and it, it grew out of my own experience in the context of this pandemic, believe it or not. Um, when, you know, when I finally realized, oh, this isn't gonna just be a month. I, I mean, I literally figured, well, we'll got the staff, we'll just hold off on in-person things for a month and then we'll start up again in April. Um, and then I realized, oh, this isn't going to end in April. So I said, well, the end of April. And then finally May realized, wait a minute, there's something going on here. It's not what I expected. Um, anyway, in the course of doing, I finally realized that um, we were going to be in this kind of situation um, for a while. And at one point I said, you know, I got to figure out, I can't just go on habit here. I mean, I've I, I realized, I said, wait a minute, I need to like look at my rule of life. I need to rethink what do I need to do for Michael's inner world? And I was doing a, a talk or something and I was rereading that Matthew 22 where the lawyer comes to Jesus and, and um, you know, said, what's the greatest law? And Jesus, you know, goes back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus. You shall love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I looked, I said, wait a minute, there's some wisdom in that. You shall love the Lord your God with, with your whole self, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, 
Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. That third is implicit in the second because it's contingent on, it, it, it's, it's actually, they are interrelated. And I started thinking, okay, what if I just, for, and I, I literally did this for myself and then I started sharing it with folk in church. I said, okay, what if every day I kind of think, now, how can I love God today? Just, just one thing. What's one thing I can do that's somehow an outgrowth of love for God? What's one thing that I can do today that's, that is an expression of loving my neighbor, somebody other than myself? And it can be as small as writing somebody um, or as large as participating in some big campaign to accomplish something. But what, what is it? What is it I can do today? And what is it I can do to love on Michael Curry? And I said, if I can get all those three, if I can get into that loving trinity, um, get into that, that of God, neighbor, and self, genuine love, I don't mean selfish love, I mean genuine love, then maybe I'm on. So I started saying, you know, don't get, don't get too complex with your rule of life. Keep it simple. What can you do to love God or to dwell in the love of God intentionally? What can you do to love your neighbor, others, <laughs> something for, somebody else for others? And what can you do to love yourself? What, what, what does that look like? And I started to realize, you know something, that there's something good. So I actually bought, I used to go to the gym. Um, and my wife said, I attend a gym like people attend church. That doesn't mean they worship. That just means they're in the building. But anyway, she said, you just go to the gym and talk to people. And there's some truth in that. But I got an exercise bike to take care of Michael. And so what I, part of what I do is my workout at home. I can't go to the gym and do that anymore. Um, and so I'm doing it at, at home. And that came out of realizing I got to love God. I got to love my neighbor and I got to love myself. And you know what? That's not about selfish love. That's about loving the self that God has created in God's image and likeness. And that's healthy. Amen. We have two more questions for you. And uh, both questions are gonna ask you for some advice, okay? The first is, is, uh, is as, a, as, a, as a near neighbor um, who wrestles with the issues of, of racism, structural racism, anti-black anti racism. And um, as, as uh, Reverend Jackie Daly reminds us, uh, we have similar issues in Canada and Canadians and, and in the church are in have long been in denial about this, 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 the state of, or the extent of anti-Black racism here in Canada. We sometimes like to think we're, we're uh, we don't have the same challenges mm -hmm. as our neighbor does, but uh, white supremacy, priest brutality are, are part of our story too. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's asking, are there opportunities for sharing best practices with the Anglican Church of Canada to build this beloved community in North America? What what advice would you have for us, or what best practices have you observed in the United States or in the Episcopal Church that we might might learn from? Well, I, you've done some some remarkable work, I know, um, uh, around residential schools and uh, First Nation peoples and repentance and and the work of repentance and repairing the breach. I mean, you, you're in the midst of, you, you, you're ahead of us there. I'm, I'm here to tell you um, because um, native peoples in the United States um, are the poorest of the poor in this country. And there have been no treaties that have been kept. I mean, it, it, can, it just continues to this day. Um, I do, you know, I mean, I, you know, it would be interesting. We haven't um, had that conversation. I have to talk to your Archbishop, talk to Linda about this. That's a good idea. But one of the things we've done a lot of work um, with around racial justice and reconciliation, creating um, actual curricular materials that people can use. I mentioned um, Sacred Ground is only one. There's another called uh, Becoming the Beloved Community. There's a whole, and they're free. If you just go to the Episcopal Church website, they're there for anybody to use. They're not, um, we got no proprietary, I mean, it's, it's the gospel. Um, so, I mean, if anybody's got a copyright, I think it's Holy Spirit. So that's fine, please use them. Um, but we've created a number of materials. Um, there's been, and we've got so much work, a lot of work um, that we're still in the middle of, to be honest, 
um, but diocese after diocese are doing it, of doing the kind of work of, of, of learning truth, facing truth, telling truth um, from of our past. Um, and where that comes into play is how has the church, how have we as the church benefited? Um, how did we benefit from slavery even to this day? I mean, even to this day, when I was, this is a side note, but I, when I was Bishop of North Carolina. Um, and I was blessed to be the Bishop here for 15 years uh, before I became presiding Bishop. And, and I love this diocese, love the folks. But I, I'll never forget the day I was sitting in the office. Now here I am, you know, black Bishop, I'm the first black diocesan in the South. And um, uh, uh, my assistant uh, came in uh, that one day and she was beat red. Um, I mean, she was white, so I could tell she was red. If she was black, I wouldn't have known, but, but I could tell she was red. And she was, I mean, she was beat red. And I remember saying, Sarah Jo was wrong. And she said, um, you need to read this. And so she handed me a little piece of paper and it was called the Corbin Scholarship Fund. It was an endowment that had been created, uh, I think early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century. And, and, and it said that every bishop is required to read this and then you have to sign that you will abide by it. Um, the Corbin Scholarship Trust has been created for the benefit of the white race um, and is to be used for those, whatever the equivalent of a, it, theological education wasn't the language, but that's what they were talking about for theological education, basically for seminarians. Uh, for theological study. Um, and I had to sign to agree. I said, Sergio, I can't sign this. And she said, well, I didn't think you <laughs> would, but I'm obligated to show this to you. And so I remember saying it. I said, how long has it been going on? She says, since, well, the turn of the last century, um, it's been going on. That was an endowment that was created by money from slavery to keep slaves from getting a the theological education, a descendants of slaves from getting the theological education. So I, you know, I fired off a letter to the Episcopal Church office and copied the design, then presiding bishop and wrote the treasurer and said, oh, there's no way in the world. I'm. And it was only in the South, only in the Southern diocese. See, there had been no black guy there to see it. Um, well, I went to the next bishops meeting of the bishops in the fourth province in the South, came to find out a lot of them had been rejecting it. Um, they just hadn't talked with each other. Um, there were some others who were quiet, which makes me think they took the money and ran, but nonetheless, so we agreed that we're going to start bombarding New York until they break the trust. They need to go to court, break the trust. And eventually, it took some years, but eventually they did go to court, broke the terms of the trust, or had them changed or something, so that now it's just a scholarship fund. But the truth is, the money had its origin in slavery. It did. And so we've been asking dioceses, look, face into the past. Um, and, 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 and don't grovel in, in, the point is not to beat people up. The point is, okay, let's face the truth, hear the truth, learn the truth, and learn from the truth of the past. Um, what the dark past has taught us is in the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And then to learn from it, and then to work together. Now, how can we repair the breach? How can we repair the breach? What can we do now? that repairs it. We can't solve it. We can't change the past, but we can work to repair the breach that continues to this day. So what can we do together? And then what can we do together to create a new future? That is the process of metanoia. <laughs> From repentance, facing the truth and learning and turning <laughs> and heading in a new direction to together building and creating a new future. That's the work. And we got the curriculum. I mean, our stuff has been designed around that, those models. And there are dioceses that um, have done some real intensive work. The state of Mississippi just changed their flag, the state flag, uh, to remove the Confederate battle, the stars and bars. Um, and, and the diocese, the Episcopal Diocese of Mississippi, had been leading that charge, I'd say, for the last 15 years at least. Um, and that grew out of their work of anti-racism and racial reconciliation work that they were doing in Mississippi, I mean, more than 15 years ago. Um, and so it does even have social consequences. Um, and so I, I do think, I think coming together to, to face truth, South Africa was wise to have a truth and reconciliation commission, not just truth not just trying to jump to reconciliation, but truth and reconciliation. 
that creates the context for facing painful truth, learning from it, and turning from it. That empowers people to build a new future. And anyway, go to the Episcopal Church website, look under racial reconciliation or racial justice and reconciliation, thumb around, and everything there is free. You can have it. And if anybody says something, you tell them I said so. I mean, right. that made a difference, but tell them anyway. <laughs> If the Episcopal Church website somehow crashes tomorrow morning, I, I won't mention any of this. All right. don't say, yeah, don't say a thing. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for 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 uh, for those words. And I, I suppose uh, that's probably the biggest temptation or or just potential distraction we have to be mindful of is is allowing our our own little projects, our own little frustrations, our own little illuminations to remain just that our own. And it's by bringing coming together as a wider community that we can keep this momentum and and the focus. Uh, and the uh, work of improving and, and, and building justice uh, moving forward. So, okay, thank and you. I gotta say, can I just add, I mean, yeah. one of the things I was in a meeting, um, oh, it was about a month ago, uh, which Archbishop Lin, Linda um, and the Lutheran uh, presiding bishop and the Lutheran presiding bishop from here, from the States. And uh, we, were, we meet twice a year or something like that. And in the course of that meeting, we were talking about sharing some resources along the same lines. And, you know, one of the things, we're, it was clear. I said, you know, you are way, we have much to learn from you in particular um, about engaging both repentance and reparation and reconciliation um, for First Nation peoples, indigenous peoples. Really, you're ahead of us. I'm telling you, you really are um, that, um, um, the American story um, and story of the indigenous peoples of the native peoples here, um, it, it's, a, it's a nightmare of a story. And, it, and it, to this day, it's just, I mean, the reservations are being ravaged um, um, by COVID-19. Um, Navajo land is one of our diocese and, and is, but they've been smart. They closed off the reservation and even, and actually the Sioux did the same thing in the Dakotas. Um, and the governors told them, you have to let people in. And they said, no. And they said, no. <laughs> um, and God bless them. And they, they've they been able to keep their numbers under control because they were about to be overwhelmed. Um, so we've got much to learn from each other. And um, we were talking about some ways to do that kind of sharing because um, we want to be better and we can be better. We can be. We are not victims of fate unless we do nothing. We are people of faith. And I believe the language of faith is filled with action verbs. Follow me and I will make you follow me. Indeed. And may we do so. We're going to end on a note of hope. At least I hope so. We're gonna, and Susan Clark's gonna help us do that. Because for the other recommendation uh, to ask you is, as we approach Advent, is there a passage in the Bible that you think we should study during Advent as we prepare for the coming of Christ this Christmas and as we seek to nurture our hope and faith in what is possible? You know, this is going to sound strange. I, I wouldn't have said this a month ago, but... Romans 12 and 13, and maybe 14, but certainly Romans 12 and 13, um, that great Cranberry and uh, 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 the Advent Colic, um, uh, great, we may cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility. I mean, that is a great, that is some serious prayer. That is just, I mean, that is good religion if ever I've heard it. And Part of that prayer is based on um, the end of Romans 13, uh, where Paul, that's really Paul's language. But if you look at chapters 12, and the reason I've been looking at them of late is that um, I was wrestling with chapter 13, um, which is about all government is instituted of God and all of that. And that's often used to justify the status quo. Well, I said, wait a minute now, hold up. Read chapter 13 in light of chapter 12, and keep reading all of chapter 13 when after Paul says, pay taxes to whom taxes are due, you know, whatever to whom, whatever is due. And then he says, but oh, no one, anything except to love one another. 
And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself is to fulfill the whole law of God. I said, ah, I see it now. There's Paul talking about how can you be a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, even with citizenship in the empire? Love your neighbor as yourself. And um, he goes on this extended thing. Well, in chapter 12, he had been talking about love toward the end of chapter 12. Um, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Love what is good. And then he says, uh, do, vengeance is my, do not avenge yourselves. Do not love your enemies. He, clearly, Paul is riffing. It's like a jazz artist. He's riffing off of the Sermon on the Mount. That's what's going on. He's, he's kind of, he's, he's improvising off of what Jesus taught, taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying, love your enemy. Um, for by loving your enemies, you heap burning coals of fire upon their heads. Um, no, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Then he talks a little bit about government, and then he comes back to love again. Now, last time I checked, anything that comes before and something that comes after, what's in between is de defined by what came before and what came after. Context always defines everything. If I say I love you in church, that means one thing. If we're having a candlelight dinner and there's a violinist playing in the background and I say I love you, that could mean a very different thing. You see, the context defines the meaning of the content. That's basic literature 101. Uh, it's Bible reading 101. Um, and the truth is the context in which Paul talks about government is love, unselfish, sacrificial love that seeks to do good, even taking evil and using and doing good. That's the, and so I'm beginning to realize that all of that is a buildup to the college for the first Sunday of Ad Advent. Let us cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor, the protection of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in that last day, in that last day, that's why there is hope. Because the last word is God. And the Bible says God is love. And if that's true, as I believe it is, my brothers and sisters and siblings, then there is always hope, no matter what. I, I trust that Susan thinks there's enough there to get her through Advent. <laughs> Although you we were really only giving her the first Sunday of Advent. To, 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 that was just a... <laughs> but, one, one Sunday. Let's, let's give her four Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you all are wonderful. You really are. Thank you for spending this time, really. Uh, Bishop Curry, um, if ever there was a there was an experience that even though we can't gather physically in person, we can still connect. We can generate energy together. Uh, we can be together. You certainly have brought that this evening with the energy and engagement you have. I wish I could rehearse some of the, some of the comments you you and uh, responses to some of your answers. But they've been really positive. I'm, I you know there's there's still a few more questions, but we uh, but. Um, I, th I think we've asked sufficient from you and we've got enough to chew on at least for until the first Sunday of Advent. So, so right. I think we'll, on this, you know, thank you so much um, you. for a very special evening. And so on behalf of the Larkin uh, Stewart Committee, on behalf of Trinity College, the St. Saint Thomas's Church, and everyone who's, who's gathered, and I'm so grateful to everyone who made some time after probably a long day on Zoom to to uh, show up, and I'm sure they're very glad they did. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you so much. Wonderful. God bless. Thank you. Here we go. Well, I'll now uh, turn over the proceedings to Father Chris D'Angelo for the closing prayer. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Oh God, who wouldest fold both heaven and earth in a single piece. Let the design of thy great love lighten upon the waste of our wraths and sorrows and give peace to thy church, peace among nations, peace in our homes,
and peace in our hearts. Through thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Provost, do you want to dismiss us for the evening? <laughs> I won't say convocatio dismisso est, uh, but thank you. Thank everyone so much. Of course, uh, Bishop Curry, that was just so moving and, and, and so timely. Thank you so much for your, your generosity and, and your hopefulness. And, and to everyone else who participated and made it a wonderful program. I think it's a really meaningful tribute to the uh, deep relationship uh, between Larkin and Stewart, of course, and between Trinity and St. Thomas. And uh, I wish everyone who, who was joining us tonight, I hope you, I hope you found this as enriching and, and uplifting as I know I did and, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much. And thank you very much, Chris. Take care. <laughs>